Audible Studios presents Victory, Legacy Fleet, Book 3. Written by Nick Webb. Performed by Greg Tremblay. Chapter 1 Cadiz Refugee Camp, Number 127. Outskirts of Gunaratana City, Indira, Britannia Sector. Lieutenant Rodriguez stepped into a murky puddle in the middle of the street, wrinkled his nose, and swore. Oh, for hell's sake. It was the 27th century. Technology had launched humanity to the stars. Dozens of planets had been colonized, and galactic civilization had, up until four months ago, flourished on a scale few had ever dreamed of. And now there was raw sewage flowing freely through the streets. The refugee camp was bursting at the seams, having accepted over double the half-million refugees from the Cadiz sector it had been designed to hold. As Lieutenant Rodriguez made his way down the muddy, sewage-infused street, the wails of sick babies rang in his ears. Small, dirty children huddled forlornly under their equally harrowed mother's arms, peering out the doors of their temporary shelters, looking for the next shipment of food and water from the city. It wasn't coming. Rodriguez knew. The shipments had slowed to once every several days, then to once a week. The next one would not come. Something else was coming instead. They were coming. Dusk began to color the sky. The sun had set several minutes ago, possibly for the last time, Rodriguez thought. Time was short. In spite of the crying children in the background, the refugee camp was eerily quiet as he crossed the final hundred meters of mud, refuse, and sewage to reach his family's shelter. His own children would be waiting for him, hopefully with their bags packed like he'd instructed. As he opened the door to his family's shelter, the refugee camp sirens began to sound, adding their urgent wail to the children's cries. That could only mean one thing. They were here. Papa! His daughter Elsa ran up to him and hugged his lower torso. Thomas sat in the corner, hovering over his grandmother, who was supposed to be taking care of them, but instead had fallen sick with an illness that had left her feeble and coughing, lying weakly on the shelter's only bed. Lieutenant Rodriguez peeled Elsa's arms off and approached his mother. Her face was ashen, but she managed a weak smile. Are they ready? he asked, leaning down close to her. She gave a small nod. Are you? he added. Her shaking hand reached out to his. Go, she said with some effort and descended into a fit of coughing. Her hand came away from her mouth, spattered red. I'm not leaving you, Mom. He stooped over to pick her up, but the woman with surprising strength pushed him away. I said go. They're ready. You're out of time. Get them to safety, I'll be. She glanced at Thomas and Elsa, forcing out a grimaced smile for their sake. She always was a wonderful actress. I'll be fine. The sirens wailed outside, crowds shouted in the dusky air. Rodriguez breathed a silent curse but sprang into action, grabbing the two bags sitting by the door. His own belongings were in his hangar at the fighter base on the other side of Gunaratana City. As a fighter pilot, he has a general rule-packed light, but there was no time to retrieve his own things. There was no time for anything except to run. They were coming, in force. He'd seen the scans play out on the monitor of the hangar bay just over half an hour ago. Twenty swarm carriers, plus something new. The unthinkably massive super dreadnought that had made its first appearance the week before in the swarm's invasion of the Mao cluster. Mao Prime no longer existed. Eight billion people no longer existed. Scouts reported that the surface... Once the glittering cosmopolitan jewel of the Chinese Intersolar Democratic Republic was now a sterile, fiery wasteland. He pushed his children through the door and cast one last glance back at his mother, still on the bed, wan and pale. She mouthed, I love you. He blinked back tears and could only nod a curt reply before turning back out into the rank, muddy street. The transport would be leaving soon. They had only minutes to spare. As they navigated the busy streets, which had erupted into a frenzied mob of panicked refugees, 
now that the emergency sirens were wailing in force. He wondered if he'd be court-martialed for abandoning his post. But really, he thought, what good would one more lone fighter craft be against the unstoppable force that was coming? How could they court-martial a man just trying to get his kids to safety? Could one man really make a difference against such incontestable power, such reckless hate? Cranger had, the hero of Earth. He supposedly died and returned, beating back the swarm in the process. So the rumors said, though Rodriguez didn't quite believe them, video proof be damned. It didn't matter. He looked up at the darkening sky and his stomach clenched as he focused on a small cluster of bright lights above the eastern horizon that steadily grew clearer. Twenty small dots surrounding the larger one. They were coming. So was the hero of Earth. He'd heard chatter that Granger's fleet was on its way, coming to the rescue. But he'd seen the tactical scans. There was no way he'd arrive in time. The man may have been a miracle worker, but it looked like his lucky streak was over. By the time the bricklayer showed up, the entire world of Indira would be a wasteland. Just like Mal Prime. Just like the Cadiz Sector and the Veracruz sector. Merida, New Oregon, and Calibri all gone. Five minutes later, they arrived at the local spaceport. After a few panicked moments of desperate searching for the transport, he started to wonder if it had left without him. Are we too late, Papa? asked Thomas. Rodriguez swore under his breath, but breathed a sigh of relief as they rounded a corner and saw it, a small freighter, its captain waiting impatiently on the still-open ramp. Come along, Asa. He coaxed his daughter forward. Thomas followed close behind. He climbed the ramp, but not before glancing back up at the sky, looking for the cluster of bright lights that signaled their world's certain doom. They were bigger, closer and more spread out. Several were still near the horizon, while others had risen high into the sky overhead. The ground shook, starting as a low tremor and escalating into a moderate shaking that rattled panels inside the freighter. Rodriguez watched the horizon with a sickening feeling and felt his face go white as he saw a mushroom cloud rise in the distance, hundreds of kilometers away. Stop gawking and shut the damn hatch, yelled the freighter captain from the cockpit. Lieutenant Rodriguez hit the ramp retractor and ushered his kids to the rows of seats. All were full, except for three. They settled into them after fiddling with the restraints. Hey, said a teenage girl sitting across from him. Is that a pilot's uniform? An IDF pilot? He looked away, ignoring the girl and busied himself with Elsa's seat restraint. Why aren't you out there? Why aren't you fighting for us? The girl was visibly distraught. She shook. Her eyes were wild, darting back and forth from the closed hatch back to Rodriguez and over to the cockpit. They're coming. They're coming. Why aren't you out there? They're coming. They're... The woman next to her grabbed the girl's arm, her mother or grandmother. Quiet. He's getting his kids out. He's just the same as us. But he's a fighter pilot. He could stop them. He could... The woman shook the girl until she fell silent. Nothing can stop them. One more won't make a difference. You just mind your own business. Nothing can stop them. Rodriguez pulled a necklace out from beneath his uniform and began thumbing the beads, whispering silent rosary prayers. He knew they were rising through the atmosphere now, well clear of any of the dreaded singularity weapons that were now ravaging the surface. But making it through the perimeter of the swarm fleet would be another feat entirely. One more won't make a difference, the woman had said. But besides the rosary, there was only one thought in Rodriguez's mind. Granger, where the hell are you? Granger. Where the hell are you? Chapter 2 Bridge, ISS Warrior 0 0.3 light years from Indira, Britannia Sector Captain Timothy Granger paced the warrior's bridge. It was late, and it was killing him inside. Each second that ticked by was like a dagger twisting in his gut. Because he knew that with each tick... Another 10,000 people were likely dying. Initiating Q-Jump 27, said Ensign Prince. 
The scene on the view screen shifted, and the central bright star grew slightly larger. And around that star, a planet, and on that planet, people. Millions of people. And drawing nearer to that planet, with a disconcerting head start. Any more word from CENTCOM about the swarm fleet approaching Indira? Ensign Prucha slowly shook his head. Sorry, sir. All outer system bases went quiet fifteen minutes ago. Last word was over twenty incoming vessels. Damn. The swarm had abruptly changed tactics the past two weeks, with deadly effect. Rather than slowly waltzing their way into a system, giving the population time to panic and scatter, they'd taken to striking as quickly as possible with overwhelming force. Instead of three swarm carriers here, four there, their enemy had entered a new phase of the war. A phase of extermination. You ain't seen nothing yet, she had said. That young pilot, Fishtail, had spoken those words after her life was saved by injecting her with swarm matter. She wasn't lying. The scale of the new swarm offensive was breathtaking. Three entire worlds destroyed in the past two weeks. Hundreds of ships lost. Billions of lives. And the next target, Indira. Right in the heart of United Earth territory. Less than five light years from Britannia itself. Fifteen light years from Earth. And Granger was caught with his pants down, stationed at Britannia, ready to defend against an attack that never came. The hammer was striking Indira instead. Ready for Q-Jump 28, he said. Sir, the ISS Colorado was reporting trouble with their cap bank. They need five minutes to lock down the problem and recharge. He shook his head. No, leave them. Ready for Q-Jump. Not having the Colorado there would hurt, but getting there five minutes later would hurt more. Plus, fighting with thirty-seven ships instead of thirty-eight ships wouldn't make much difference especially if the swarm had brought their newly unveiled super-dreadnought. While not quite as large as the massive swarm orbital space stations they'd destroyed over Volari III, the planet that had turned out to be the homeworld of the Dolmasi, the super-dreadnoughts were formidable. Easily ten times the size of the run-of-the-mill swarm carriers, packed with antimatter beam turrets, and loaded with the singularity weapons the Russians had provided them with. There were only three or four of them, the intelligence community hadn't come to an agreement on that point, but whether there were three or three thousand, the result was the same. Utter destruction. Ready, sir, said Ensign Prince. Initiate. The view screen shifted again, and the central star, Indira Prime, grew even larger. Just two more jumps, nearly half a light year, and they'd be there, late, for the battle of their lives. Or they'd find a broken, empty, devastated world, depending on how late they were. What do you think? Commander Proctor had been working doggedly at the science station, conferring with their new science team, immersed in a project that had consumed nearly all her time the past few weeks. But now she sidled up next to his chair and bent low to his ear. More too late. She nodded, apparently in somber agreement. And if we really are too late, what then? Stay and fight? Wait until we've got backup? Wait for the Domasi? He grunted. If we don't fight them here, then we fight them over some other world. Here's as good a place as any, and if the planet is already ravaged, best to limit the destruction. She lowered her voice. But if it's the case that the planet is lost, wouldn't it be more prudent to at least wait until Zingano shows up? Granger shook his head. Weren't you listening earlier? He's dealing with a sudden incursion into the Maori system. Small rate of only four swarm ships. But his fleet won't be here for hours, at least. Only four ships. He inwardly chuckled that he now considered four swarm carriers to be a small raid. Four months ago, four ships had nearly destroyed Earth. While their defenses had improved since then, Zengano would lose at least a dozen capital ships and tens of thousands of men and women in that engagement, with only four ships. Proctor scowled. I didn't hear. When was that? Just ten minutes ago. He eyed her warily. You okay, Shelby? She glanced around the bridge before dropping her voice to a whisper. I think I'm on to something. The team and I. What? He scanned the bridge as she spoke, watching the officers and crew. 
Proctor had subjected every crew member of the warrior to the blood test that revealed swarm infiltration, and though no one else had tested positive after Doc Wyatt and Colonel Hanrahan, Granger was still wary of speaking openly of either IDF's strategic plans or Proctor's swarm research. For all he knew, the blood test was incomplete, and there could still be swarm agents among them. Best to practice good OPSEC hygiene in the meantime. Just something about the fundamental mechanism behind swarm communication. With the metaspace signals. It's quantum-based, using gravitons, quantum particles. Right. He wasn't sure where she was leading. But the singularities, they're not. All equations governing gravitational waves, gravitational singularities, gravitational anything, at least on a macro scale, is general relativity-based. Quantum mechanics and general relativity? Those two branches of physics just don't mix very well. We haven't reconciled them in the seven hundred years we've known about them. And here the swarm is using both of them to devastating effect. The view screen shifted as they made another cue jump. Only one more before showtime. And? he murmured. And? That's it, mostly. Just a hunch. I've performed a few experiments I want you to look at later. Some of the results are... interesting, to say the least. Ensign Prince glanced back. Ready for final cue jump, sir. Granger nodded. Proctor retreated back to the XO station where her deputy, Lieutenant Diaz, had been making preparations for the battle. Now that it was upon them, she took up her post, glancing at the tactical crew who nodded back, indicating they were ready. As ready as they'd ever be. Granger knew he was never ready for any battle. How do you prepare to lose tens of thousands of people under your command? It was something he hadn't grown used to and hoped he never would. His nickname be damned. Bricklayer. Bullshit. Initiate, he said, sitting down just as the contents of the view screen shifted. In place of the starfield centered on the distant sun of Indira Prime came the image of a planet. A devastated, broken planet. Ensign, he whispered. Ensign Prucha shook his head. All planetary defenses are silent. Every other combat is just frenzied chatter, both civilian and military bands. And some diamond at sensors worked his controls. Most major cities destroyed. The swarm fleet is spread out across an equatorial orbit, targeting the smaller population centers. Thousands of colonial transports and freighters are trying to break free of orbit, but they're being intercepted by swarm fighter craft. Once again, he was left with the choice of who to save, who to fight for, who to die for. The hundreds of thousands of people in orbit who would form the next wave of refugee camps in the adjacent star system? Or the millions of people left on the ground about to be either burned alive or vaporized in a singularity explosion under their feet? He gripped his armrests, knuckles white. He'd had enough. A yell erupted from his throat, culminating in a balled-up fist hitting the console swiveled in front of him, which snapped off onto the floor with a clatter that startled all the crew members around him. All eyes were on him. Where the hell is that super dreadnought? Diamond scanned his console. At longitude 59.24, latitude Granger cut him off, still staring at the wrecked planet below. Send coordinates to the fleet. Prepare for maneuver Granger Omega-3. Commander Proctor looked up suddenly, her face bunched up with concern. Tim, we've only tossed that idea around, never practiced it. Haven't even run simulations. Are you- Now's as good a time to practice as any, he replied, maintaining his fiery stare at the screen. To her credit, Proctor sprang into action, erupting into a flurry of orders. Alert all crew on decks one through five to move to higher decks. Ensign Prince, full acceleration along heading 15, mark eight. Prucha, coordinate fleet positioning behind us. Within a minute, preparations were complete. He could just barely feel the pull of the thrusters straining away at maximum, the inertial compensators struggling to keep up, pushed past their limit. The extra thrust, adding to the inexorable pull of the planet's gravity, was building their velocity up to a range that would take them far out onto a wide elliptical orbit after they swung around the planet. But not before they blazed past the super-dreadnought at a dizzying speed, with Warrior in the lead, shielding the rest of the fleet. 
It was a good reason they called the maneuver Granger Omega-3. It could very well be the last thing Granger ever did. Time, he said. The bridge had fallen to a deadly quiet. Sixty seconds. Granger nodded. Cut thrusters, rotate us with aft lateral thrust. Show them our belly. Done, sir, Ensign Prince said after a moment. All ships. Granger lifted his head to the interfleet calm. Prepare to fire on my mark. Keep your heads and remember the pattern. He glanced up at Proctor, who nodded once, confirming all was ready. And if we don't make it out of this one, it's been an honor serving with you. However, he nodded toward the tactical station where ten officers were staring at him, grim-faced. I do not give you permission to die until that piece of comrade shit is destroyed. On my mark. Fire. Destroyed. On my mark. Fire. Chapter 3 Star Freighter Lucky Bandit, Low Orbit, Indira, Britannia Sector Elsa and Thomas both jumped nervously against the restraints as the freighter lurched again. It was clear to Lieutenant Rodriguez that the captain was repeatedly changing their heading, to avoid either swarm fighters or debris pluming up from the dozens of Singularity impact sites on the battered continent below. After calming the children down, he glanced toward the passenger compartment's lone viewport, a round thing less than half a meter across. Indira's atmosphere looked like a thin shell wrapping around the fragile, besieged planet, a shell that was rapidly turning from a vibrant living blue to a sickly brownish gray over the dozens of spots where the ground had erupted outward. Too numerous to count, the mushroom clouds seemed to expand up past the edge of the atmosphere and into space itself. The planet was bleeding. How many people had just died? The last sounds from his hurried walk through the camp still rang in his ears, the sick, crying babies. Were they silent now? Probably not. A swarm would target the major cities first, and only make it to the smaller refugee camps once the larger population centers were smoking craters. But other babies were silent in their place. Rodriguez wished he could cry but the magnitude of the loss was too great to comprehend. Besides, he'd already mourned his own planet, Merida. He'd already mourned his extended family, his hometown, and everyone he ever knew. He'd already mourned his wife. How could he have anything left to mourn? The freighter lurched again and again, a third time. He knew what that meant. They were under attack. The captain was flying a merchant freighter, He'd have little experience evading swarm fighters. Hell, no one had experience evading swarm fighters. But he wasn't going to trust his kid's fate to some merchant freighter pilot. He ripped the seat restraints away and maneuvered around the rows of seats, tripping over passengers' legs as he ran to the cockpit. When he got the door open, he found the pilot and his co-pilot arguing heatedly. Just a glance through the viewports told him what he needed to know. The swarm was all around them. Looking down at the sensors, he grimaced as three contacts approached from three different directions. They were being hemmed in. I'm telling you, Avi, we're no match in speed for those things. We can't just blaze past one and think they'll ignore. The co-pilot shook his head and swore. Rav, all I'm saying is doing something is better than doing nothing. We can't just go back and land, for God's sake. And what, are you just gonna pick a random direction and hope it doesn't take us past a fighter? For hell's sake, there's three of those bastards zeroing in on us right now. Rodriguez squeezed the shoulder of the co-pilot. Gentlemen, if you will allow me. The co-pilot, a short, stubby man with a close-cropped black mustache, shot him a dangerous look. Get back in your seat, sir. I'll get around to the cabin beverage service after we figure out how to not die. Rodriguez scowled. Look, I, the co-pilot twisted around suddenly in his seat and patted a bulge under his vest. I'm not going to ask you again. Sit. Lieutenant Rodriguez glanced at the bulge. Could be a firearm, but probably just a canister of chew, and swore as the freighter bucked again as the pilot chose another direction. Look, see these? He pointed to a pair of small medals pinned near his flight suit's shoulder, just under the epaulet. Is one here? Wings on fire. Any idea what that means? Before the co-pilot could answer, Rodriguez did it for him. Fighter combat. 
and the one next to it, the one with the number 15 on it, any guesses? A proximity alarm went off as the nearest swarm fighter closed in. Raf, the pilot, swore and punched it off. Are you going to go sit down, flyboy, or do I need to— It means I've been in orbital fighter combat bloody fifteen times against the comrade bastards out there. He jabbed a finger towards the viewport. The distant swarm fighter was quickly becoming visible to the naked eye. So if you want to live, give me the controls. Now! Avi looked like he was about to jump up and try ripping Rodriguez's arms off. Why, you little ignorant piece of AWOL shit! He reached into his vest and pulled out the firearm. Rodriguez grit his teeth. He had been sure the man was bluffing. I'm giving you to the count of one to get the hell- Avi, began the pilot. Stand up. Give him your seat. He jabbed his thumb towards the cockpit door. No, don't give me that look. You're half drunk anyway. Go. Get up. When Avi hesitated, looking from his gun to Rodriguez to the co-pilot controls, Raf repeated himself. Go! Before you put a hole through the hull. Now! Avi grumbled as he thrust himself from the seat and stalked out of the cockpit. The pilot glowered at him as he left. Don't worry, he said, watching Rodriguez take Avi's place. The gun was empty. He just carries it around for show. Micro-dick compensation, most likely. Now, are you going to show me your fancy flying or what? That's the idea. Rodriguez studied the controls. It was similar to his fighter cockpit, but just different enough to give him a moment's pause. Time to intercept. The pilot glanced at the sensor readout. A bogey will be here in twenty seconds. What's the maximum acceleration on this thing? Same within inertia canceling limits, about two point five. I didn't ask about inertia canceling limits. Tell me, maximum acceleration. The pilot considered a moment. Five G's, but that'll give our passengers quite the scare. I don't know if... Now live. Rodriguez pushed the control stick to maximum and flipped off the acceleration governor. Maybe. A thrust nearly took his breath away. He heard his kids scream behind him as everyone was thrown violently against their restraints, and he could swear he heard Avi fly through the air and crash into the bulkhead. But all that mattered now was getting them to safety, wherever that was. They're still gaining on us, and our trajectory is straight at the planet. The pilot's face turned white. Straight at that plume coming from what used to be New Bangalore. We'll just skirt through the top. Hold on. The billowing debris cloud loomed in the viewport ahead of them. From far away it had looked static, but now that they approached, Rodriguez realized the cloud was expanding at what was probably a supersonic rate. He wondered how good the freighter's shielding was. The pilot apparently read his mind. If there is any debris in there bigger than a grain of sand, we're goners. We're goners anyway. Here we go. They plunged into the cloud, and the freighter began to lurch violently as the turbulence from the debris plume buffeted the ship. After a few seconds, Rodriguez shifted the controls, veering the craft hard to the left, still at maximum acceleration, staying in the turn until he had nearly completed a full about. The pilot nodded his understanding. Hoping they keep a straight course. Meanwhile, we pop out of the cloud right where we entered it? That's the idea. A moment later they cleared the plume, and the violent shaking ceased. But Rodriguez maintained the gut-churning acceleration. A quick glance at the sensors told him the gambit had partially worked. The swarm fighters trailing them were nowhere to be seen, probably on the other side of the massive debris plume by now. But ahead of them loomed a new nightmare. The swarm super-dreadnought. Flanked by two regular-sized carriers, Green antimatter beams lanced down towards the planet, raking across towns and smaller cities, even as a half-dozen bright points shimmered around the giant ship, growing singularities, readying for their imminent launch. "'We're screwed,' breathed the pilot. An odd reading on the sensors. Rodriguez studied the anomaly. A large mass approaching at a dizzying speed. No, not one large mass. It was broken up into several discrete pieces— approaching as one large clump. Had one of the swarm carriers broken apart? Raf's eyes widened as he studied the readout. Is that what I think it is? Rodriguez scanned the transponder frequencies. They were IDF ships, packed together into as tight a formation as he'd ever seen, moving faster than any fleet had a right to. He grinned. Yep. The hero of Earth had arrived. Yep. The hero of Earth had arrived. 
Chapter 4 X-25 Fighter Cockpit, Indira, Britannia Sector Lieutenant Tyler Ballsy Voles gripped his controls. If he wasn't wearing flight gloves, he imagined his knuckles would be white with tension. With good reason. They'd never practiced the Granger Omega-3 maneuver before. Lately, he hadn't practiced much of anything. All he could think about was Fishtail. He visited her every day, or rather visited what had taken her place. A smug, overconfident swarm agent, at least when she wasn't under full sedation. Gone were Fishtail's mild-mannered wit and sarcasm, her easygoing charm. In its place was... something alien. Utterly foreign. Holcraft, prepare for lunch. Watch yourselves, people. None of you have ever launched at this speed before. And you most certainly have not launched all at once like we're trying today. The CAG, Commander Pierce, listed off the instructions one final time. Each fighter, in its turn, would launch exactly one-third of a second after the one before it. All one hundred and fifty of them. The accelerations would be gut-churning, the distances between fighters uncomfortably small. There was no room for error on this one. And the giant osmium brick tied to the undercarriage of each fighter more than doubled each craft's mass. Maneuvering would be difficult. The Granger Omega-3 maneuver. Omega, an appropriate term. It would most likely be the last thing they ever did. He glanced to his left, down the line of fighters with their engines idling. Space Champ, Pew Pew, and his brother Fodder. He'd sure miss them. Commander Pierce's voice cut through his headset. Stand by. Five seconds. Three. Two. One. Now. To his right, the line of fighters started shooting out the giant bay door one at a time every point three three seconds. Much of it was computer-controlled, but not the actual maneuvering. When his time came, the engines roared to life automatically, and he barely had time to steer the nose of his fighter out towards the exit and space beyond. Fifty seconds later they were all in position, forming a vast halo around the ISS warrior. Thirty-some-odd heavy cruisers bunched up tightly behind the giant tungsten armored carrier, all of them blazing toward the planet ahead of them. In orbit above that ravaged world— stood the largest swarm ship any of them had ever seen. It was still a tiny dot, but it grew larger. All craft, came Pierce's voice. Brick launch on my mark. Valls checked the computer calculations one more time, ensuring his thrusters were linked appropriately to the targeting computer. All clear. Launch. He flew back against his seat as the fighter leapt forward into starboard, and moments later he felt the telltale clank as the osmium brick detached. A moment later he reversed thrust, aligning his nose with the edge of the warrior's bulk, and maneuvered his fighter around the ship. There was no time for all of them to land in the fighter bay, and staying out to fight during the flyby was pointless. All they could do was hide in the shadow of the warrior like the rest of the cruisers. Hide and pray. The rest of the cruisers. Hide and pray. Chapter 5 Starfreighter Lucky Bandit Low Orbit, Indira, Britannia Sector Something seemed dreadfully wrong. Not coming in way too fast. That doesn't make any sense. Rodriguez studied the sensor readout, even as he pointed the nose of the freighter on a trajectory that would eventually let them break orbit and make their first Q-jump. Whatever, said the pilot. As long as they keep the bastards distracted while we make our getaway. And it's not just us, there's thousands of other freighters and colonial transports trying to make a break for... Thousands of tiny explosions leapt out from the super dreadnought. Ah, damn! Rodriguez watched the scene unfold in amazement. Granger, with his fleet coming in close behind, had oriented the warrior so the bottom face of its hull was fully exposed to the super dreadnought and its two smaller companions. But peeking out from the shadow of the warrior were hundreds of magrail turrets from the tightly packed fleet of cruisers, each ship positioned such that its hull was protected by the warrior, but with a clear enough view of the super dreadnought that it could fire several steady streams of ultra high velocity magrail slugs. Which they did. Thousands of impacts erupted all over the massive super dreadnought. It, along with the two escort carriers, opened up a devastating volley on the rapidly approaching warrior. 
raking the underside of its hull with dozens of antimatter beams. Rodriguez could only imagine the destruction on the lower decks. Pretty gutsy. But they're flying past in less than ten seconds. I still don't see how much good it'll do, said Raff, shaking his head. Watch. I see it now, interrupted Rodriguez, pointing at the sensors. They just barely detected over one hundred small projectiles which rocketed away from the warrior. Small, but thousands of times larger than the standard Magrail slug, and traveling at fifty kilometers a second. The incoming IDF fleet, still sheltered by the warrior, continued pummeling the super dreadnought, some ships even turning their attention to the two swarm carriers. But Rodriguez understood it now. The conventional fire was a ruse. Moments later, his suspicion was confirmed with a violent, eye-piercing explosion. One hundred and fifty eye-piercing explosions. I don't believe it. Raff couldn't take his eyes off the disintegrating super dreadnought. From the hundred and fifty massive, gaping holes erupted a hundred and fifty streams of debris, smoke, and fire all up and down the hundred kilometers long spine of the ship. I don't believe it he repeated breathlessly. That's Granger for you. Rodriguez pushed hard on the accelerator. Now that the swarm ships in the immediate vicinity were focused like a laser on the IDF fleet, it was the perfect chance to hightail it out of there. They still can't win. Even without that super dreadnought, there are over twenty swarm carriers in orbit. Granger only has thirty-six ships. Plus he came in so fast he'll be flung out toward the outer solar system unless he can miraculously arrest his velocity in the next two minutes. Rodriguez shook his head. He'll figure something out. He always does. The pilot regarded him for a moment in disbelief, like an atheist, skeptically eyeing the firm faith of a sincere believer. But he shrugged and began plotting their course toward a point where it would be safe to make the queue jump. Or at least that was his intention. Instead, he gawked at the sensor readout again. Yeah, but what's he gonna do about that? Rodriguez's eye followed the pilot's outstretched finger. The sensor readout had more bad news. Its outstretched finger. The sensor readout had more bad news. Chapter 6 Bridge, ISS Warrior Indira, Britannia Sector. Granger was beginning to regret his order. The Granger Omega-3 maneuver was wreaking havoc down on the lower decks. The ship trembled and shook violently. The Super Dreadnought and its two accompanying carriers were unloading everything they had straight into the warrior's gut, tearing their lower hull to shreds. But the results spoke for themselves. After twenty seconds of fleet bombardment, the Super Dreadnought was beginning to show signs of extreme duress, to put it lightly. Massive power fluctuations coming from the Dreadnought! Ensign Diamond yelled over his console. Granger nodded and inclined his head toward Commander Proctor. Brick status? Launch in ten. He studied the sensor readouts coming from the Super Dreadnought, then waved over to the comm station. Send a fleet. Retarget accompanying vessels. Aye, aye, sir, said Ensign Prucha. Moments later... The idea fleet, protected under the shadow of the warrior, redirected fire toward the other two swarm ships hovering near the super dreadnought, which also began to erupt with thousands of small explosions where the magrail slugs ripped into their hulls. These three buggers are toast, Granger thought. But he was paying for it, dearly. The bridge jolted to starboard violently as several of the incoming antimatter beams connected with one of the main inertial cancelers. Those things were embedded at least five decks within the lower hull. Damn, they were cutting deep. The bridge jerked again, and out of the corner of his eye, he saw the marines stationed near the bridge entranceway sway and struggle to remain on their feet. Granger counted silently in his head the remaining seconds, and moments later Proctor announced, Brick launch, impact in five. Prepare for attitude realignment. Put it on screen, said Granger gripping his armrests ferociously to steady himself against the violent buffeting of the incoming storm of antimatter beams. At least we'll get to enjoy the show. Just moments after the view screen focused on the swarm super dreadnought, which had redirected its fire to the incoming osmium projectiles in a vain attempt to destroy them, the gaping holes appeared in blinding explosions as large chunks of the hull were blasted away. 
Each osmium brick, though only a few tons, was moving so fast that it slammed into the massive vessel with the energy of over a hundred megaton-class nuclear warheads. And even though the ship was dozens of kilometers long, it was no match for explosive energy on that scale. As Warrior and the rest of the fleet flew by at nearly fifty kilometers per second, reorienting itself so the smaller cruisers would remain in the shadow of Granger's ship, the Super Dreadnought shuddered as it disintegrated into hundreds of smaller, smoking pieces. Excited whoops and cheers erupted on the bridge, and Granger, for the first time that day, allowed himself a small smile. Full reverse. Two times safety limits. Settle us into an orbit that will take us to the next cluster of swarm carriers. Commander Proctor looked up from her status board. Heavy damage on the lower decks, sir. Main inertial cancellers are out. Numerous casualties on deck six and seven. Her face tightened into a pained expression. They nearly cut all the way up to main engineering, Captain. Just a few more seconds and we would have been goners. How much thrust can we sustain? They had to arrest some of their speed, otherwise they'd fling out from the planet hundreds of thousands of kilometers away from the battle, leaving the ravaged planet to its doom. From the looks of his planetary sensor readout, the swarm had already devastated dozens of cities with singularity blasts, likely killing millions. Tens of millions. But there were still a handful of major cities left, and hundreds of smaller towns that had to be defended. Auxiliaries are only rated at half the safety limits of the primaries. And full reverse. Double the safety standards of the auxiliaries. He punched the internal comm. Hold on, folks. We're about to have a rough ride. He noticed Proctor shoot him a raised eyebrow. Again, he added. As the reverse thrusters engaged, they were thrown back against their seat restraints, then forward, then backward again as the inertial canceller struggled to keep up, swinging like a pendulum between the extreme acceleration vectors they were trying to balance. The deck plate seemed to groan, and Granger could hear the screeching of twisting metal deep within the walls. How much more could the old bird take? He shook his head. Damn it. The old bird was dead still sitting on the main boulevard in South Salt Lake City, where it had crash-landed and skidded to a halt, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake. IDF engineers had decided to leave it there, building up a giant scaffold around the broken hulk as they performed a refit. The goal was to restore her, though she wouldn't be ready for months yet. But he still hadn't shaken the habit of calling the warrior his old bird. He heard a groan from the sensor station, and almost simultaneously he heard Proctor mutter a curse. He glanced over at her. I'm almost afraid to ask. She looked up, her face taking on an almost resigned expression, as if she knew this battle would be their last. Two more. Super Dreadnoughts just Q-jumped in. They'll intercept our course in five minutes. The math was starting to weigh on Granger's mind. Twenty swarm carriers still orbited the planet, pummeling its already ravaged surface. Less than a third of the planet's population likely was still alive. Two new dreaded super dreadnoughts to deal with. The warrior was a wreck. Admiral Zingano with his fleet was occupied with its own invasion light years away. Sir? Proctor said, eyeing him. He sighed. Prepare for Q-jump. He sighed. Prepare for Q-Jump. Chapter 7 Bridge, ISS Warrior, Indira, Britannia Sector The bridge fell quiet in the aftermath of his order to Q-Jump. From the way they eyed him, it was clear that they were expecting to make a strategic withdrawal, to stand and fight another day, somewhere else. He saw in their eyes that it pained them, but that they were prepared to do it. To run. But Granger had never retreated. Ever. And he wasn't about to start. Prepare for Q-Jump, to these coordinates, he said, punching in a set of numbers and sending them to the helm. Ensign Prince looked at them, finally understanding Granger's meaning. We're making another pass? You got it, Ensign. He looked around the bridge. Any objections? No one spoke. Before he could continue, Commander Proctor cleared her throat. We're all behind you, Captain, she began, but he could see in her eyes what she was going to say, that strategic withdrawal was smarter, 
but he wasn't going to have any of it. He'd lectured her and Zingano, and all the other captains more times than he could count. Stand your ground and fight. Make the swarm pay for every single system they took. Never retreat. Show no weakness of will. It was either that or fight them, and retreat from them, at the next world, and the next, and the next. No. The swarm needed to be taught that humanity would never, ever, ever back down. Eventually they would learn, calculate their own losses, and realize that they would never truly win until every last human outpost was utterly obliterated. Good, he said, leaving Proctor with her mouth left half open. Sir, if I may, our lower hull is breached in three dozen locations. Engineering is a mess. Our fighters are all back in the bay, and none have been reloaded with a brick yet. And you're sending us into another Granger Omega-3 against two of those super dreadnoughts? Surely there's something else that can be done at this point. He sighed. She was right, of course, but there was simply no alternative. He held up his hands. If you have a better idea, Commander, I'm all ears. With any other officer, he'd have them removed from the bridge. But Proctor had saved his ass more times than he could count. Still, their relationship had been strained over the past two months. Ever since that fighter pilot, Valls had returned with Fishtail, claiming that he'd just escaped from a swarm-controlled Captain Granger on the other side of the Singularity. She'd defended him. Hells and Gano had defended him against General Norton, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And though he'd kept his command... Suspicions around him were high ever since. Split the fleet. Send everyone in threes and fours and engage the carriers. They're all spread out singly in various orbits. We'd last longer that way and take out more of their fleet. And if we're lucky, Zingano will show up before we're all dead. Admiral Zingano to the rescue. Damn it, that was Granger's job. But she was right, of course. And he wasn't going to let his pride get in the way of the best outcome. That was something a politician would do, and damn it, he was not a politician. He was not an Avery, or worse, an Isaacson. Do it, he pointed to the tactical station. Assign targets. Focus on those heading toward the remaining large population centers. Commander, he said, turning back to her. Make the fleet assignments. She nodded, focusing her attention to splitting up the fleet and informing the other captains. She looked back up. And where will we be going, sir? My previous order stands. When our fleet has dispersed on their assignments, we make the queue jump. He watched the view screen as the planet began to pull away. They were still on their highly elliptical course. Straight down the throats of the two super dreadnoughts. Proctor hesitated. Alone? Alone. Alone? Alone? Alone. Chapter 8 Star Freighter Lucky Bandit High Orbit Indira, Britannia Sector Lieutenant Rodriguez could hardly believe his eyes. Just minutes ago, he was watching the largest warship he'd ever seen begin launching its horrifying rain of fire down onto his homeworld, raising vast swaths of a continent, and the next moment that same ship was in pieces. It was impossible. He'd always suspected that the stories surrounding the hero of Earth were embellished and shaded with hyperbole, that the crew around Granger and the people he'd saved tended to be over the top in their praise of him. If anything, these stories were cheap, fanciful lies compared to what he had just witnessed. You know, I think that maybe, just maybe, we might make it out of this, he said. Raff, the pilot, nodded slowly his eyes still wide at watching the ongoing destruction of the Super Dreadnought. Yeah, I think you might be right. A moment later he came out of it and cranked on the controls. Watch out for those fighters. Rodriguez nodded. Look. He pointed toward the pieces of the Dreadnought, which were starting to break up into smaller, red-hot chunks. The fighters are hightailing it out of there. Let's thread the needle. You mean fly into that storm of wreckage coming off that thing? Oh, no, no, not through it. Just close enough and around it so we can avoid these fighters. Raff shook his head, but then seeing the cloud of swarm fighters approach, he relented. Rodriguez steered the freighter toward the fragmenting dreadnought. 
Soon the hundreds of bogies faded into the background behind them as they approached one of the large pieces of wreckage, a section of hull nearly a kilometer long. We're too close, said Raff nervously. We're fine. He pulled up on the controls and whipped them around the side hull section, which, to Rodriguez's surprise, disappeared in a flash. Not an explosive flash, but a bright white flash. He'd seen that light before. Be on the lookout for— He was about to warn Raff about the singularities. They could be so small that you'd never see one until you were right on top of it. But he didn't have time. It was right in their path, shimmering, deadly. The cockpit turned brilliantly white for a split second, and Rodriguez felt as if his head had just taken a direct hit. He fought against the rising sleep with its promise of peaceful oblivion. He knew he was close to passing out, but he needed to stay awake to steer the freighter to safety. His life depended on it. His kids depended on it. The view through the windows had changed. Instead of giant pieces of the shattered super dreadnought set against the backdrop of Indira, he saw only one piece, falling. Falling toward a swirling maelstrom of material. Rocks, ice, debris, dust. All falling into and colliding with a central mass. They were falling, too. Their engines were out. He felt his consciousness slipping away. The last thing he saw was the surface of the giant ball of material looming up, filling the entire window. Hundreds of rocks struck the outside hull like a million hailstones in a hailstorm. Even their relentless cacophony could not keep Rodriguez awake. Even their relentless cacophony could not keep Rodriguez awake. Chapter 9 Bridge, ISS Warrior, Indira, Britannia Sector Time, Granger asked. Still two minutes until we've matched the velocity of the incoming dreadnoughts, Captain, said Ensign Diamond. He nodded. Q jump in one. We'll decelerate the rest of the way once we've made the jump. That'll give us some time to assess the tactical situation. Proctor eyed him warily. What is there to assess? Her eyes wondered. Even though she said nothing, he answered her unasked question. We still have no idea what tactical advantages these things have. You mean other than the fact that they're a hundred times our size, sir? The remark was accompanied with a wink, indicating humor, but he continued as if he didn't hear. There was no time for humor, even gallows humor. And for all we know, they have a weakness that can be exploited if we just took the time to scan them properly and study their ship layout. You think we'll be able to study their ship schematic enough in one minute and figure out a way to destroy them? What, like fly into their exhaust port and blow up their main power reactor? Something like that. Seems a little cliché. She studied his face. Do you remember anything like these things? The super dreadnought? No fleeting memories? Lately, Proctor had been questioning him more about his vacation. His missing three days aboard the Constitution. The memories were still foggy, especially after Fishgane Karsa, the Dolmasi admiral, had tampered with Granger's mind, making him think he'd been peering down at the Swarm homeworld. Afterwards, he'd thought he was remembering the Swarm's point of origin, but the memory was false. And by thinking, wrongly, that he'd seen Volari III, the Domasi's homeworld, he had inadvertently liberated them, thinking he was striking down the Swarm. For all the good it had done them. Ever since then, the Domasi had rarely shown up to any battles when called upon. Some allies they were. He shook his head. Nothing. I remember nothing of them. Ensign Prince caught his attention. Sir? Granger noticed the time had elapsed. Initiate Q-jump. Prince engaged the drive, and Granger felt the telltale momentary sway as the change in the star field on the view screen indicated the jump was successful. Quantum effects, such as the Q-jump, were always a little more unpredictable close to a large gravity well like planets. Continue deceleration, he said. Full scan of the ships as we approach. All bands, all fields, neutron, gamma, RF, metaspace, quantum signatures, everything. And tactical? Proctor stood near her post in the rear of the bridge. The eyes of the tactical crew were on her and Granger. Show them our belly again. That section of the ship is already dark. The crew is evacuated from decks one through five, correct? Yes, but— Extend the evacuation to deck eight. Proctor looked flustered. She never looked flustered. 
The battle was getting to her, or more likely, he was getting to her. Sir, engineering starts on deck seven. Are you going to evacuate engineering? No, engineering crew stays. Tim, this is highly irregular. There's nothing regular about this, Shelby. Why would you expect it to start getting regular now? Why was she calling him out in front of the crew? If she pushed any harder, he'd have to relieve her. He couldn't have this kind of public questioning of his orders, especially not in the middle of a battle. But deep inside, he knew why. Ever since Lieutenant Valls had come back through that singularity, ever since a swarm-controlled fishtail had woken up and started fingering Granger as a former swarm agent, confirming what Valls was saying, that the pilot had talked to Granger on the other side, acting for the swarm. It was getting to her. That much was obvious. It was making her doubt his orders, wondering if every action he took was still controlled by the swarm. He needed to figure out a way to regain her complete trust. She was too valuable an asset to lose, and if she didn't shape the hell up, he would lose her. That word lingered in his mind. Asset. Was she only an asset to him? Another human brick to hurl at the enemy? Another tool in his mission for complete and total victory? But it was true, wasn't it? He himself was a tool. They were all tools. When it came to the survival of the species, none of them mattered individually. Each of them, as a member of the pack, as a carrier of the precious genetic instructions that made the human race viciously fight for survival, was expendable. Including Proctor. Including Granger. She had to understand that. We're all bricks, Commander. He looked her in the eye. The pain behind her gaze told him she understood. Very well, sir, she said with a curt nod. And send word to the CAG. I need some more human bricks. Word to the CAG. I need some more human bricks. Chapter 10 Flight Combat Operations Center ISS Warrior Indira, Britannia Sector Commander Pierce stared at the roster. The list of 150 men and women who'd committed their lives and their deaths to the safety of the warrior, and by extension the safety of all humanity. They've signed up for this, he thought to himself. All of them. Except had they? Had any of them really signed up for this? Sure, fighter pilots weren't drafted, but humanity had not signed up for this war. It was thrust upon them. It was a gift from the Russians, or the Domasi, or Avery and Isaacson, or whoever else the conspiracy theorists insisted were involved in starting the war. He'd signed up. Because of his father. All the Pierces go military. For three hundred years ever since the First Colonial War. His father had insisted. The old man had hinted that any Pierce that did not graduate at the top of his or her class at the Royal Fleet Academy on Britannia was a waste of space. So, with a combination of guilt and familial duty, Tyler signed up and graduated at the top of his class. It was what Pierces do. But this Pierce wasn't happy about it. That he wasn't happy about the decision staring him in the face. Finally, after another ten seconds of indecision, the voice in his ear erupted again. Commander, we need those fighters now. Pick thirty and be done with it. I... I can't pick who lives and dies anymore, he whispered into the calm. Tyler, began Commander Proctor in a softer voice. You can do this. I know it's hard. Thirty will die. But they'll save... Thousands, maybe millions. And those pilots will be heroes. He sighed. Will they? Or will they just be victims? If you don't act now, Commander, we'll all be victims. Fine, he said, his voice hoarse. He selected thirty, starting with the A's and ending with the H's. Alphabetical. Sending orders now, sir. Thank you, Commander, she said. Proctor out. He keyed in an instruction to the computer to open a comm link to the selected fighters and their pilots. He cleared his throat. If you can hear this, 
You are receiving an order for an Omega run. Launch immediately. Accelerate to maximum toward the Super Dreadnought at 15 Mark II. Unload your torpedoes and your guns on the target before final impact. He flipped the calm off and slumped back in his seat. His assistants, Lieutenant Schweitzer and Ensign Spiriti, gave him grim, significant looks. They all knew that they would have lost at least thirty pilots anyway in a normal fighter battle. But this way felt far, far worse. It felt inhuman. It was like he lost his humanity with every Omega run order. He glanced at the picture of himself and his wife, their two children draped over their laps as they posed for the camera in some forest on York. It was what he fought for, what kept him alive. With a miracle they might win the war, but the greater miracle would be keeping their souls. But the greater miracle would be keeping their souls. Chapter 11 Bridge, ISS Warrior Indira, Britannia Sector Granger watched the sensor readout, waiting for just the right moment. The fighters raced out of the bay, all thirty of them targeting the heart of one of the super dreadnoughts. Once they had formed up into a regular pattern, the warrior could commence firing, but for now they risked hitting one of their own birds. Not that it mattered. They'd be dead anyway, in a matter of thirty seconds. They felt awful for thinking it, but it was true. They formed up into a ring and Granger gave the order. Open fire! All the functioning mag rails on the warrior surged to life, blasting the slugs out at another twelve kilometers per second in addition to the fifty kps speed of the ship itself. In response, the two super dreadnoughts unleashed their own hell on the warrior, raking her underside with dozens of antimatter beams. The ship shuddered. A moment later, a blast several decks below threw the entire bridge crew up against their restraints. One officer who'd removed his and forgotten to refasten it was thrown up against the ceiling, where his head hit a light fixture. Granger could tell the man was dead before he hit the floor. Hell breaches up through deck seven, yelled Proctor. One of the engineering compartments is compromised. If we lose main power, there's no way to restore it. He could tell the targeted ship was already starting to move laterally, and as a result, over two-thirds of their magrail slugs missed. But it didn't matter. The other ship couldn't evade them. They were coming in too fast. A few moments later the dreadnought lit up with the brilliant explosions as some of the slugs found capacitor banks or auxiliary power lines. In a few more seconds it, too, would be destroyed. Two super dreadnoughts down in only one battle. Not bad, he thought to himself. Another explosion ripped through the lower decks, this time manifesting as power overloads at several junctions and terminals, resulting in dangerous electrical flashes and fires across the bridge. And all it took was me destroying the warrior, he thought grimly. But a moment later the view on the screen made his stomach lurch. Thirty shimmering points of light appeared suddenly right in front of the super dreadnought. They only lasted for a second, because almost immediately after they appeared all thirty winked out, as each fighter slammed into one, disappearing in a flash. Shit! Another explosion. Tim, Proctor began. We've lost main power. We're not getting it back. Reyna is not responding down in engineering. It's over. He closed his eyes. Benson Prince, how much thrust can you give me? The young man, his face white, looked at his console. Mains are out but I can give you half lateral thrust and one quarter aft. Steer us in. Clip them on their side. With any luck, whatever is left of us will ricochet into the other one. Five seconds left. The massive ship grew quickly on the screen as the warrior's incredible velocity propelled it toward a direct collision. So this was goodbye, he thought. For real this time. Two seconds. One. The super dreadnought disappeared. Did they hit it? Were they all dead? He looked around at his dazed bridge crew. He imagined death would be a lot more painful. And fiery. Where the hell did it go? Ensign Diamond at Tactical studied his sensor display. Unknown, sir. We flew by the other one. But the target itself just disappeared. His brow furrowed. Oh. Sir, I'm reading a Q-jump signature. The target Q-jumped away. Location unknown. 
Granger pounded on his armrest. Proctor's voice cut through his disbelief with more bad news. And, sir, the one we passed is accelerating, catching up to us. It'll match our speed in less than a minute. Weapons range in eighty seconds if they maintain this acceleration. Damn it. I can't even get suicide right today. Damn it. I can't even get suicide right today. Chapter 12 Bridge, ISS Warrior Indira, Britannia Sector What's our vector? What kind of orbit are we in? Ensign Prince, a little dazed at being still alive, shook his head a few times before responding. Uh, it looks like we're coming in toward the planet on a highly inclined orbital plane, though uh, we're far above escape velocity. Should take us just above the atmosphere before spitting us out into open space. Commander Proctor added, And we'll fly right by a few of the swarm carriers on the way past. By the time we pass them, that other super-dreadnought will have caught up to us. How long? Granger watched the planet grow larger as they approached. The billowing mushroom clouds had almost completely shrouded the view of the surface. He wondered how the rest of his fleet had fared against the remaining swarm carriers. Fifty seconds, said Proctor. And the fleet? She glanced at her task force tactical display, which Lieutenant Diaz had been using for fleet coordination. Holding their own, for the most part. Five swarm carriers destroyed. We've paid for it with nine lost cruisers. Doing the math in his head, he came to the grim conclusion. The swarm was going to win this one. Thirty seconds until Dreadnought intercept. Around the same time we'll pass three carriers. Proctor looked up. If we angle ourselves just right, we might be able to take out all three. He flashed a wry gallows humor grin. A chance to redeem our previous failed suicide attempt? Very well. Do it. Another dread silence fell over the bridge as the crew at the navigation station made their calculations, and Ensign Prince reoriented the ship and adjusted the orbital vector slightly to plow them right into one of the carriers. With any luck, they'd careen right through it and into a second one on the same path. Hopefully the blast front would take out the third hovering just out of the flight path. It was as good a death as any, taking out three whole carriers. Ah, uh, sir, began Ensign Prucha. Incoming transmission. Please say Admiral Zingano finally showed up, thought Granger. Source? I may be mistaken, but it looks like it's coming... From the dreadnought. Granger spun around. It's coming from the swarm? Looks like it, sir. He blinked in surprise at his console. And it's visual. Granger, his head half cocked toward the front view screen, nodded incredulously. Put it through. The image of the devastated planet disappeared, replaced by another image. That of an alien. Not swarm, not domasi. A third alien race, vaguely human but with tighter skin, almost a bluish tint. Captain Granger, will you make alliance with us? Granger's automatic reply sounded surreal in his mouth. We will. They were the only words to say, really. And who do we make alliance with? The fifth house of the Concordat of Seven. You've shown us we can throw off our masters, just as you did with the Dolmasi. Granger cut his hand across his throat, eyeing Ensign Prucha, who muted the audio. He shot a glance at Commander Proctor. It's got to be a trick. They have us at their mercy. Maybe, she said. But what choice do we have? He shrugged and nodded toward Prucha, who restored the audio. Very well. To prove your sincerity, would you mind neutralizing the Valarisi carriers that are just now coming in range? he said, using the name the swarm used for themselves. The alien, to Granger's disbelief, nodded once. By all means, Captain. Please maneuver your ship around ours to shield yourselves. We detect that you cannot take much more damage. Granger signaled Ensign Prince, who maneuvered the warrior as the alien had suggested, putting the dreadnought in between it and the three incoming swarm carriers. Captain, the dreadnought is opening fire on the carriers, began Ensign Diamond. Full spread of antimatter beams. The view screen split, half still displaying the new alien and the other half showing the carnage. 
The dreadnought had at least ten times the number of beam turrets as the carriers, and within fifteen seconds of the flyby, the targets were in ruins, breaking apart and blazing through the upper atmosphere. Captain, said Proctor, her voice betraying her disbelief. Receiving word from the fleet, the rest of the carriers are pulling out, one already made a Q-jump out. She looked up at him. Shall I order pursuit? He nodded quickly, still paralyzed by disbelief himself. The new twist of events had happened so suddenly, so illogically, that he was still trying to process it. New contact, sir, said Ensign Diamond, who broke out into a grin. It's Admiral Zingano and his fleet. The dreadnought broke off from their escort vector and accelerated toward another swarm carrier that was blasting away from the planet, trying to make its escape. Over a hundred green beams lanced out from the dreadnought, overwhelming the carrier. The dreadnought eclipsed the fiery death throes of the much smaller ship. Maybe they detected Zingano's imminent arrival and decided to make their move? Maybe, said Granger. I suppose we'll get their explanation shortly. He watched as the dreadnought reoriented itself and rejoined Warrior's flight vector. He couldn't help but feel he'd cheated, or that someone had cheated. It was too easy. They were about to die. Twice. That alien had better have a damn good story. That alien had better have a damn good story. Chapter 13 Senator Joseph P. Hill Memorial Shipyards, Athens, Alabama, Earth Vice President Isaacson smiled as widely as his strained, exhausted cheeks would allow him to. As the hovering cameras nearby zoomed backward into the air and panned wide, he relaxed the rictus grin a bit, knowing that the actual crowd assembled on the street below wouldn't be able to see him as closely as the ever-present cameras, wouldn't be able to see him sigh ever so slightly. They would never see him like she saw him. She saw everything. She was always there in his every waking moment, governing his thoughts, his feelings, and, of course, his actions, and, to a lesser extent, his words. At least his spoken words. But he had to tightly govern his running mental commentary. He couldn't even call her bitch anymore. Not in his mind, at least. Not without suffering ungodly agony. An unfortunate side effect of having thirty mind and emotion-reading implants capable of delivering Fifty-four millijoules of brain-bending pain apiece. In certain moments, talking with certain senators or Russian agents with whom he was still trying to uphold the facade of agitator-in-chief, he allowed himself to unload on President Avery, calling her every filthy name his frenzied mind could grasp at. With those people, he had to maintain appearances of a murderous traitor, and so she allowed him to play the part. But with everyone else, with the public... He was to be the cheerleader, Avery's number one surrogate. Thank you, thank you. You're too kind, he said, his voice amplified by a microphone hovering just a meter in front of him. Thousands of people had crammed into the plaza and neighboring streets to see him in person. It was just another ribbon-cutting ceremony for the newest heavy cruiser coming off the line at the nearby shipyard. But the people of Athens, Alabama, were proud of their contribution to the war effort. It was their fifth ship completed since the start of the war. All four of the previous ships had been lost, of course, just like over sixty percent of all newly built ships these days. But the pride of the crowd was palpable. You know, back when I was interning for Senator Hill, he paused for dramatic effect, I guess some of you may have heard of him, the crowd roared. The late Senator Hill was, in fact, an Alabama native. Back, back when I interned for old Joe, he told me, he says, Eamon, the people in my senatorial district are simply the best people in the galaxy. More roars from the crowd. Isaacson continued. The crowd was putty in his hand. He may have hated his forced servitude at the scheming hands of President Avery. But this part, the adoration of a war-weary crowd, this part he loved. Now, he says to me, Eamon... The people in my senatorial district are simply the best in the galaxy, he said again, expertly knowing that the key to any good political speech was 
Repetition, repetition, repetition. And do you know why they're the best, Eamon? It's because they never give up. They never give up. They're the most badass, unbreakable people on the planet. They never give up. And you know what, Eamon? You know what? If the swarm ever comes back, the shitheads... I'm sorry, folks, Senator Hill was pretty colorful, if you know what I mean. The shitheads will never know what hit them. He paused to let the crowd scream ecstatically again. Old Senator Hill was an Alabama legend, especially here where he grew up. It didn't matter that Isaacson was making up the story about the old bastard. One hundred percent blatant fabrication. The crowd ate it up. When old Joe died, a few years later, he continued slowly, adding a note of heaviness to his voice. The crowd hushed. When old Joe died, I found a letter in my mailbox the next week. He'd included it in his will. Imagine, little old me, just a snot-nosed intern getting a personal letter from a United Earth Senate legend. I opened it, hands trembling. The crowd was utterly silent. I pulled out the letter. I read it. I read it again. Tears came to my eyes. He continued, filling in with meaningless words as he racked his brain for what to say next. There was no letter. He had only interned for the old codger for a week before the man died suddenly of a heart attack during a blowjob from some prostitute, and Isaacson had never even met him. But he needed a good line for the crowd. And through my tears I saw the firm, handwritten signature of that patriot, that giant of a man. He cleared his throat, summoning a good show of emotion. The words he wrote are these, and I quote, A sacrifice made in the service of your fellow countrymen is no sacrifice at all. Brilliant, Eamon, he thought as the crowd went wild. He held up a hand. Thank you for your sacrifice. I know you've seen hunger, pain, loss, and seemingly endless war. And through it all, you've persevered. You've given us a fighting chance against our mortal enemy. You've given us this, he said, indicating the giant cruiser in dry dock about a kilometer away. He slipped in a few more anecdotes some good old-fashioned, folksy, homespun wisdom, pumped up the crowd with a bit more cheerleading and finally called it a day. Three speeches in a row, three starship naming ceremonies, three ceremonially broken bottles against tungsten iridium hulls, hundreds of local dignitaries and factory chiefs and shift managers, thousands of handshakes. His hand ached, his back ached, his head ached, and when he finally collapsed on his bed at the end of the day, he groaned when his comm card alarmed, indicating she wanted to talk to him. He couldn't mentally swear at her. He couldn't slather her with creative insults and curses. All he could do was take a deep breath and tap his fingers against his leg in the same rhythm as the syllables of one particular insulting vulgar phrase. He couldn't think the words. She'd hear that, and she'd punish him severely for it. But he tapped the rhythm. Tap, 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 tap. Tap, 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 tap. It was his only release. The only way he could impotently strike back at her. The alarm sounded again, and one of his thirty implants buzzed slightly. Not painfully, but as a warning. Don't keep me waiting, Mr. Vice President. I'm not a patient woman. He pulled his calm card out and tapped it. Yes, Madam President. Good work today, Mr. Isaacson. I trust you're not too exhausted. Three naming ceremonies. Three. That sounds downright tiresome. She laughed. Tap, 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 tap. Don't worry, I'll let you sleep soon. Any word from Ambassador Volodin? Not yet. He says an audience with Marikov is highly unlikely, but that he'd pull all his strings to arrange it. Good, said Avery. We need to get you in there. Much depends on it. If I may ask, Madam President, why not just meet him yourself? If the message you want delivered to him is that important, 
Wouldn't it carry more diplomatic force if it was the President of United Earth delivering it? She laughed. Oh, Eamon, you're so incredibly naive sometimes. Tap, 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 tap. Oh? He couldn't help but let a hint of sarcasm seep into his voice. Luckily, she let it slide. His implants remained silent. Mr. Isaacson, the message I want delivered is one that is suited uniquely to you. She laughed again and added, Besides, it wouldn't look good at all if I were the one to negotiate with Mr. Malikov. Just think of the optics. I'm the badass, no-nonsense, take-no-prisoners president of United Earth. I can't be seen talking to war criminals. He'd been halfway through sitting up to walk to the bathroom, but he froze. I beg your pardon, Madam President? Was she actually thinking of sending him off alone, outside her influence to talk to her mortal enemy? You heard me, Eamon, she said, using his first name for the first time in two months. You're going to negotiate with President Malikov, in person, in his own office. You need to get inside his head, see what he's thinking. Otherwise, we don't stand a chance. He heard her take a sip of a drink she was holding. The clink of the ice rung against the glass. She continued, And if that doesn't work, then you'll sabotage his secret computer network, preferably with a bomb or something, in full view of live television cameras. The whole galaxy will see it live. She laughed again. Should cause quite a stir, don't you think? People will see that we're finally striking back against the Russian bastards. Oh, don't worry, I know what you're thinking. I'm sure you'll escape the blast. Well, reasonably sure. Ha! Tap, 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 tap. Ha! Tap, 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 tap. Chapter 14 Sick Bay ISS Warrior High Orbit, Britannia Vols watched her through sick bay's windows. She was asleep and still bound to the bed by thick straps and cuffs. They weren't going to take any chances with her. Commander Proctor had done some tests involving metaspace signals and determined that, while Fishtail was unconscious, the swarm was not able to control her or send and receive signals through her. But even so, it was safest to keep her chained. When she could transmit the swarm virus with the touch of a single finger, it was the only thing that made sense. A transparent panel had been set up around her to prevent medical staff and other patients from inadvertently brushing up against her skin. But otherwise, sick bay still made the most sense as the place to keep her. That way she could be easily kept under sedation and under constant monitoring. He watched her, just as he had almost every evening for two months, when he wasn't flying his bird, or training his squad, or sleeping and eating, he was here. Was she in there somewhere? Could she be saved? Proctor had assured him that she could be saved, just like Granger. But he had trouble believing his XO when he passed away the long hours watching her. If you keep watching her this much, I think I'm going to rename you Stalker. Tyler Stalker Vols. Vols gave a short, gruff laugh. What do you know about stalking, Space Champ? She stood next to him, watching the former pilot sleep. Clearly not as much as you, Ballsy. Though if a guy were to stalk me, I think I'd want him to at least leave me some chocolates or something. Maybe some small talk. If I was really drunk, maybe a quickie. He looked at her, aghast. Kidding, Ballsy. She turned to him. Seriously, man, you're obsessed. What's up? You can't go on like this, pining over her. You guys weren't even an item, right? I mean, she was married, has a kid. He waved a hand dismissively. No, nothing like that. It's just... She was on my team. And she threw herself into that thing to save the ship. And she made me promise to go tell her kid that everything would be okay. And I just... I don't know. For a while she was dead, and then miraculously she was alive. And I rescued her, but now she's in limbo, and I... I'm just hung up, Space Champ. It's hard to explain. He wasn't even sure why he was there. Are you just scared that you'll end up the same way? Space Champ folded her arms, studying the sleeping pilot. That you'll go into the void and then come back changed? Different? That you'll lose yourself? Demon possession? 
He rolled his eyes. This isn't some B-movie space horror show. And yet, there she is, changed, taken over by an alien race. Sounds like a horror show to me, she said. Yeah. He rubbed his arms. He'd clasped his hands behind his back for so long that they had started to prickle. I guess this is a horror show. It could happen to any of us at any time. Dogtown, taken by the swarm, then killed. Those are the two pilots. And Hanrahan, Doc Wyatt. She pat his shoulder. Don't worry. At least there won't be any aliens bursting out of your chest and dancing on the bar. And remember, Granger came back. If he can, so can Fishtail. Yeah, I know. I keep telling myself that. Space Champ turned to leave, then paused. You know why they call me Space Champ? Uh, didn't you just pick it because it sounded cool? <laughs> you know you don't pick your own call sign. No, they called me Space Champ when I was first assigned to the Oregon. I wore my hair in a bun, and the guy said I looked like that cartoon character from when we were kids. Remember her? Space Champ? A zany, happy-go-lucky nerd girl turned space pirate? Robbed from the rich inner soul of plutocrats and gave to the poor? Balls shrugged. I played basketball, never watched many cartoons. Well, continued Space Champ, the thing with that cartoon was... Space Champ was a goon. A total gamer girl with bad grooming habits and crazy hair that she wrapped up in a bun. When those jocks called me Space Champ, it wasn't a compliment, believe me. Behind my back they called me, and I quote, Eterna Verge, referring to their belief that I'd never get laid in my entire life. That first week was horrible. You know what I did? I got in that cockpit and I decided that I'd be the best goddamn fighter jock any of those bastards had ever seen. I put up a friggin' full-size poster of Space Champ on my locker. I plastered her name on my helmet, and I owned it. I wasn't going to let them define who I was. And by the time a month had passed, I was the best. You know why? Why? Mainly because the rest of them were killed by the swarm. They had it coming, the bastards. God rest their souls. She crossed herself. Balls had forgotten she was religious. But I lived. I survived. I fought my way through and clawed my way out when those other wankers got themselves killed. By the time I left, Space Champ was my badge of honor. It was my title that said, Suck it, bitch, I'm better than all your sorry asses. She turned and pointed to Fishtail. She survived. Both because she's a kick-ass pilot and because you risked everything to bring her back. She had the lady balls to put her life on the line for all of us, throwing herself into that thing to save the ship. Something tells me she's going to fight this thing and win. You just watch. Valls shook his head, finally turning to face her. You haven't talked to it, Space Champ. You don't know. You don't know what it's like. It's completely taken her. When she talks, it's all swarm. All hate and malice and chest-thumping and dick-waving about how they'll overcome us all and make us all friends. Or kill us all if we resist. I just... I just worry that in spite of her bravery, in spite of me bringing her back, that we've lost her after all. He bit his lip. And then I'll have to go back to that house again and tell them that their daughter and his mother is dead again. I don't know if I can handle that. He was looking her in the eye, but she seemed distracted. Following her gaze, he scanned sickbay for what Space Champ was looking at and gasped. Fishtail was awake, and staring right at him with dead, glassy eyes, a joyless smile curled the edge of her lips. He put his hand on the window. One of the nurses noticed the monitor beeps announcing Fishtail's return to consciousness and raced over to the transparent enclosure, jabbing a few times at the automatic IV to dispense a new dose of tranquilizer. A few moments later she closed her eyes again and fell asleep. That look... That look on her face. He shuddered. The expression had horrified him. But there was still hope, wasn't there? She's got to be in there. He pulled his hand back from the window and made a decision. He needed to talk to her. A break past the monster and reach Fishtail and bring her home. Again. And reach Fishtail and bring her home. Again.
Chapter 15 Conference Room, ISS Lincoln High Orbit, Britannia She calls herself Vice Imperator Scythia Krull. Says her people, the Sciora, have been servants of the Swarm for thousands of years. She claims that once they realized the Dolmasi had managed to throw off Swarm influence, it inspired the Sciora to do likewise. Admiral Zingano scratched his facial stubble as he studied the schematic of the Super Dreadnought, displayed on the conference room wall. Sounds damn suspicious if you ask me, Tim. And even as he said the words, something stirred in the back of Granger's mind. Something, someone, once told him about the swarm. But the words eluded him. Was he remembering something he learned during his vacation? On the opposite wall of the conference room was a video feed, displaying the image of President Avery, surrounded by General Norton and a handful of her military and intelligence advisors, seated in the command center of her new presidential starship, Galactic One. Interstellar One had been destroyed two months ago by unknown saboteurs. Somehow the woman had managed to avoid an impressive number of assassination attempts. How convenient for them, she said with a snort. Now there come to Jesus moment came right as Bill's fleet was about to show up. Granger nodded in agreement. The optics are unsettling, I agree. And Krull did tell me that she didn't decide to make her move until she received intel that Bill was on his way with the fleet. She, or he, I've discovered you really can't tell very easily with the Sciora. I uh, thought that switching sides during a major battle would be a lot more devastating to the swarm than to do it all by themselves alone. Basically, she wanted to desert when she was assured that she'd have the cover of our fleet. If she did it alone, she reasoned the swarm would have destroyed every single Skiora ship. Bastards, muttered Avery. Just like that shithead Casa, using us for their own gain, using us like a shield, or in Casa's case a spear, and risking our lives instead of their own to free this planet. I'm telling you, gentlemen, if we ever get out of this thing with the swarm, we're going on a nuke spree with these other bastards. Things were so much simpler when all we had to worry about were the Russians and a long-dead swarm threat. She seemed to notice Commander Proctor's eyes widen a bit and chuckled. Not to worry, Shelby, I'm not as cutthroat as that. Still, I'm getting sick of the politics. I, I know politics is my game. I'm good at it. Hell, I thrive on it. But intergalactic interspecies politics, where I don't even know the motivations of all the players, is a bit much for even my tastes. Admiral Zingano's brow furrowed as he studied the dreadnought's layout on the schematics displayed on the wall. He gestured toward Proctor. And what do you make of this, Commander? These super dreadnoughts are basically extremely large copies of the regular swarm carriers. Similar interior design, same weaponry. Nothing like the Dormasi ships. Proctor nodded. It sure does look like one of two things. Either the Sciora are using ships supplied by the swarm, or perhaps building their own based off design supplied by the swarm. She trailed off, her brow furrowing as if realizing something. Or, Zingano prompted. All eyes turned to her. Or, the Skiora gave the designs to the swarm, or even built the carriers for them. Think about it, the regular carriers have corridors, consoles, even door handles, though the swarm themselves are essentially liquid. Why? Well, look at the size of those corridors, consoles, and door handles. Everything matches the Dreadnought. The Dreadnought, which happens to be a perfect match for Skiora ergonomics. They're a little shorter than us, it seems. Smaller hands. She turned to Avery. I think we've finally solved the mystery of where the Swarm gets their ships, and why they're designed how they are. Avery leaned in toward the camera. Do you think that the Skiora are the Swarm's shipbuilders? Could it be possible that they've just lost their shipbuilding capabilities with the Skiora defection? Proctor shrugged. It's just speculation at this point, ma'am. And they could be playing us, said Granger. This still gives me a bad feeling. Playing us? Zingano shifted uncomfortably in his seat. They destroyed five carriers before the swarm hightailed it out of there. Doesn't sound like a particularly effective strategy. Feign friendship and destroy swarm carriers. Look out, here come the humans. Quick, let's pretend to be their friends while we blast our real allies to hell. He sniffed. Cynical cloak and dagger false tactics like that work great in novels, but in real-life military strategy, I'm not buying it. Proctor shook her head. 
You're forgetting that the allies of the swarm are not independent individuals, she said with a glance at Granger. He knew what she was insinuating, consciously or not, and it grated on him, even if his annoyance was unfair. The Domasi, before they managed to throw off swarm control, were completely and utterly controlled by the swarm. Likewise with the fighter pilot we recovered, Fishtail. She is swarm. Same with Doc Wyatt and Colonel Hanrahan. They weren't swarm allies, they were swarm. So saying it doesn't make sense for the Skiora to shoot up a few swarm carriers to pretend to be our friends is missing the point. And the point, Commander. Zingano looked impatient. The point is, if they are playing us, it's not the Skiora who are playing us, it's the swarm. Assuming the Skiora haven't broken swarm control over themselves, every action they take is not their action, it's swarm action. Avery nodded in agreement. And the implication of that? What do you think, Shelby? Proctor shrugged heavily. Just that as we try to decipher the Skiora's motivations, we can't look at it from their point of view. We still need to look at this from the Swarm's vantage point. They certainly could be capable of executing a false flag attack on their own ships if they think it could give them a strategic advantage over us in the long haul. Granger shook his head. The Swarm has overwhelming firepower and numbers. In all our battles, they've never relied on anything but sheer blunt force. Their tactics have been, shall we say, lackluster. They're slow to adapt to quickly changing orbital battle conditions. It's like they have two modes, attack with overwhelming force when they think they can win, or retreat when it looks like defeat is imminent. Zingano nodded. You're right. I don't buy it. This is totally out of character for them. My experience with them matches yours, Tim. Why would they suddenly use subterfuge in a misdirection like this? President Avery glanced at them all in turn before pursing her lips. Right. So, we take the skill raw at their word, at least until we have reason to believe otherwise. But in the meantime, be careful, gentlemen. Just as with the Domasi, we do not share intelligence about fleet movements or capabilities. By the way, she turned to Granger, how big is their fleet? Ah, uh, yeah, that's another interesting point. According to Vice Imperator Krull, the only ship the Skiora deploy is the Super Dreadnought, and they have six of them. Up until yesterday, that number stood at seven, and we were just moments away from destroying a second one before it Q-jumped away. Avery nodded. Brilliant work, by the way. Those dreadnoughts outpower you, what, two hundred to one? And you took it out within a minute? Brilliant. Thank you, ma'am. And putting your own life on the line to do it, shielding the rest of your fleet. Very admirable, Mr. Granger. There are those who toss brick-laden epithets your way. Her eyes darted to General Norton, whose frown stiffened. But I think you've shown you're willing to throw your own life away to stop these bastards. You've got a spine. You have my full confidence in spite of recent events. Her eyes moved around the room again, laying her eyes on the assembled admirals, generals, and captains. Her meaning was clear. Ever since the fighter pilot Vols had reappeared with Fishtail, claiming that a swarm-controlled Granger was on the other side of the singularity they had traversed. It seemed that the top brass trusted Granger even less than they did before, Admiral Zingano being the lone exception. Some days it seemed that if Zingano were gone, Granger would find himself in a solitary cell deep inside CENTCOM intel, or worse, airlocked. Speaking of recent events, Proctor began, has IDF science come to any conclusions about Vols's trip? Avery glanced at a man seated next to her. The head of IDF Science, Commander Rome, cleared his throat. As far as we can tell, Vos's fighter was gone for about half an hour, judging from his shipboard computer. We can detect no tampering with the records. From the warrior's perspective, he was gone for less than an hour. So, whatever time dilation was present within the event is markedly less in Vos's case, he said, using the more neutral the event or Granger's disappearance rather than vacation, as everyone else called it behind Granger's back. Rome continued. However, Lieutenant Miller had been gone from our perspective for over two months. Obviously, we don't have access to her fighter, but we analyzed her DNA, looking at telomere length and a few other markers, compared it to her last physical, and came to a rather remarkable conclusion. From her perspective, 
She'd only been gone a few minutes at most. Proctor nodded knowingly. The others looked perplexed. Strange, she said, connecting the dots for the rest of them. Tim was gone for fifteen seconds, which for him was three days. Vols was gone for half an hour, and from what we can tell, that's how long he thinks he was gone for. But Fishtail was gone for two months. And for her, the time dilation wasn't stretched, but instead it was compressed somehow, since for her she was gone only a few minutes. She turned to the chief scientist. Has idea of science run any more simulations of matter traveling through a micro-singularity connected wormhole? Non-stop, he said. Of course we know little about them, other than the fact that we've indirectly observed their existence not once, but three times now. But in all our simulations, we've run up against the hard truth that in essence we are physical matter, which is governed by quantum mechanics. And inside the event horizon of a singularity, even an artificial Micro-singularity. The rules are set by general relativity. All our models break down and we're left with guesswork. I mean, it's a miracle the three of them came out in one piece and not creamed into a soup of atomic particles. Avery cleared her throat. Shelby, you look like you're hiding a secret. Spill it. What do you think is going on with these trips through the singularities? Oh, nothing certain, but... But the timing of those three singularity events seems to suggest one of two things. Either the time dilation component is completely random, or it's being precisely controlled. From the other end... General Norton rolled his eyes. Precisely controlled? How would whoever's on the other end know where and when to send everyone back if they're in the past? Commander Rome held his hand up. Or oh, the future? Honestly... Until four months ago, I would have thought if time travel was possible, the only direction one may travel is into the future. Although I concede that based upon what Vishkane Karsa has told us, along with Commander Proctor's groundbreaking work on swarm detection through blood test, it's undeniable that Granger went to some point in the past during the event. I mean, he clearly has blood markers for former swarm influence. Granger tried to stifle a grimace at the reminder that he was once under swarm control, but Proctor only nodded again, seeming to catch more of the chief scientist's meaning than Granger did. He made a note to ask her about it later. Perhaps it had to do with her secret swarm matter research she'd been conducting with her new team when time allowed. She had said she'd made a minor breakthrough, though since the battle yesterday he hadn't had time to bathe, much less grill her on the results. Silence fell around the table as everyone was reminded about the possibility that Granger could still somehow be under the influence of the swarm. So now what? said Avery. I want a plan. We've been on defense ever since the Valare Three incident, but now we can count on not having to fight the super dreadnoughts, at least, but the swarm has pulled out all the stops, and we're getting our asses handed to us. Bad. Give me something, gentlemen, something audacious, something bold. Zangano shook his head. We still, after four months, have no idea where their real homeworld is. What about that Skiora captain? What's her name, Vice Imperator Krill? Krull, corrected Proctor. Whatever. Did you ask her if she knew the location of the homeworld, Tim? Granger shook his head. We only talked for about five minutes. It didn't come up. But we established a schedule for regular communications and decided on a location in open space where we'd meet two days from now and discuss matters further. Avery locked him in her gaze. If they've been slaves of the swarm for thousands of years, as they say, I can't see how they'd not know the location of the home world, especially if they're the swarm's shipbuilders. How can you build a fleet for your masters and not know where they're filling it up with all that swarm shit goo? Get that information, Tim. Even if you have to blast your way into her ship and rip the information from her computers yourself. Hell, we've got twenty million marines just itching for their chance at real combat. I'm afraid all this space warfare has them a bit disappointed and restless. Got cabin fever, all of them. A little close quarters hand-to-hand -hand combat with these midget douche weasel skewer off folks might just be the best way to blow off the steam that they need. She chuckled a dark laugh. I don't think a hostile takeover of one of their ships would be prudent at this began Zingano. Kidding, Admiral. But only half kidding. Prudent, my ass. 
If they don't cooperate with us, we'll treat them like the enemy they are and use them as a war asset. Don't kid yourselves, gentlemen. Until we win this war, the Skiora, the Dolmasi, the Russians, hell, especially the Russians, are our enemies. No matter how much we pretend, we're still one big, happy family. She turned to General Norton, who'd been whispering furiously with an aide that had tapped him on the shoulder. General, something wrong? Yes, ma'am. We've received a metaspace distress call from the Planetary Defense Command on York and the Britannia sector. York is under attack. York and the Britannia sector. York is under attack. Chapter 16 Wellington Shipyards Gas Giant Calais, Britannia System When the order came, Rear Admiral Littlefield wasn't expecting it, of course. Such orders are never anticipated. One never plans for them. All he knew was that one moment he was signing requisition orders for fifty-three new Q-jump engine manifolds from the Industrial Center on Novo Gennaro, and the next moment he had a moment of clarity. These ships are all faulty. They need to be restarted from scratch. Littlefield paused, shaking his head. What an odd thought. He stretched his back from the customary hunched-over position he always adopted while in his cramped office chair, and craned his neck to look out the window. Over sixty gleaming new heavy cruisers floated nearby, perched against the umbilicals coming off the shipyard nacelles, scaffolding still enclosing about half of them, all waiting for their freshly commissioned and conscripted crews. And all of them were... faulty, somehow. How did he know that? He shook his head and made a mental note to himself, get more sleep, drink less coffee. Maybe, just maybe, start that exercise regimen ordered by his doctor. Okay, maybe he wasn't all that bad. But if things got worse, he'd resort to such desperate measures. But definitely the sleep and the coffee. These ships are all faulty. They need to be restarted from scratch. The thought was stronger this time, and he nearly jolted out of his chair. What the hell? And yet, on the other hand, it made perfect sense. He'd been forced to cut some corners recently. The war against the swarm was getting desperate. There was no time for the usual 600-point-long safety checklist that had been the standard before the war. He'd cut that down to the essentials, Basically, make sure the damn things don't explode at the first Q-jump. Explode on the 200th Q-jump? That wasn't as critical. Most of these ships weren't expected to make it past their 50th Q-jump. The life expectancy of an average ship was about one month from launch. Such were the times. These ships are all faulty. They need to be restarted from scratch. Not only that, the shipyard itself could use a refit. He stood up and paced his small, narrow office. He was a rear admiral. An entire career of ship-shape cleanliness, meticulous adherence to orders, and occasional strategic ass-kissing had led him to this, the pinnacle of his career. And here he was in a tiny closet that had been refurnished into an office, in an orbital installation floating over the godforsaken gas giant in the Britannia solar system that should have been mothballed last century. Wherever the thought had come from, he was right. This place was downright obsolete. Out the window, the red and orange sulfur dioxide and ammonia clouds swirled almost imperceptibly on Calais, the gas giant below. The upper atmosphere was a veritable gold mine of helium-3, which was necessary for a properly functioning Q-jump drive, so it made sense to him why the Wellington shipyards had been originally located here. But what he didn't understand was the layout, the scale. In fact, every detail about the giant structure trailing off into the distance now made no sense to him. Why were there thirty separate scaffolding structures, each building an entire ship? It would be far more efficient to have a hundred smaller structures, or two hundred, or two thousand, each building the same component of a ship, and then piece the whole thing together on down the line. Ford was on to something seven hundred years ago, had they strayed so far? The shipyard could use a refit. Why not start from scratch? He weighed his options. It was a bold plan. Start from scratch. He'd be an innovator, 
a disruptor. The entire military needed a paradigm shift, he realized, and lowly Rear Admiral Littlefield was just the man to do it. And his friends would reward him handsomely. His friends? Who well, the hell were they? He had no friends. Just superiors who thought they knew more than him, subordinates who grudgingly followed his orders. But he knew, just knew that they secretly detested him. His real friends understood him. He was one with them. With the great family. He shook his head again and sat back down to approve more requisition orders. Seventy-two fusion power plants from Earth, two thousand magrail turrets from Novo Genero, five hundred pallets of power conduit from Brunswick, eight hundred and thirty-two tons of bonded— He dropped the data pad and swiveled back to the window. It all didn't matter. They were going to lose unless he could revolutionize the shipbuilding enterprise here and then replicate that success across the other five shipyards. If IDF didn't double or triple its production rate, they were goners. These ships are all faulty. They need to be restarted from scratch. Our shipyards need to be rebuilt from scratch. Only I can do this. Only I. Only we can save humanity. We had the Nazi cry out for our help, our guidance, our friendship and fellowship. They need us. Only we can save them. That all made perfect sense to him now, where just moments before it had only been a fanciful thought. We'll fix this, he pledged. For a moment he wasn't sure if that was his thought or our thought, but the next moment the confusion passed. My, I, we, our, it's all the same. Whether by my own voice or my servants or my families or my friends, it is the same. His command terminal against the wall would do. It was connected to the secure network. Only ten such terminals even existed, and two were in this very shipyard. He logged in, giving the appropriate security credentials, presenting his retina for a scan, and giving a verbal passphrase for a voice match. The Special Armaments Command system required rigorous security. Anything less was dangerous. They couldn't risk the enemy ever getting access to antimatter armament control. He scanned through the list. Not optimal. Only half of the ships at Wellington were stocked with antimatter torpedoes. They were behind schedule. Avery had been insistent that every single ship be stocked with at least a thousand, even though the Admiralty doubted they'd ever be used. Far too slow to be effective, but it would do for his purposes. Even one torpedo would do nicely. As he entered the command, the thought crossed his mind. My mind, our mind. We will prevail, after all. None shall hurt or fear or make afraid or divide. We will be one. The command entered, confirmed, reconfirmed, and locked. He swiveled back to the window. Ten-second countdown. Ten. Nine. This should be glorious, he thought. We'll bring order. We. What the hell? Eight. Seven. Why are we counting down? Why am I counting down? Part of his mind was fuzzy, but he remembered clearly what was going on. Six. He jumped out of his chair and raced back to the terminal. There was still time, still time. Five. Four. He furiously brought up armament control, his fingers shaking. Abort! Authorization Littlefield Alpha Omega Pi Zero Zero. Three. Two. The computer chimed in with a compassionless voice. Authorization denied. Initiation process is locked. One. He spun toward the window. Simultaneously, thirty ships exploded. The fire lasted just seconds, but the debris flung outward at terrifying speeds, engulfing the sections of the shipyard nacelles the former ships had been connected to. He squinted. Dozens of kilometers away, the antimatter armament depot vanished in a haze of fire and wreckage. He collapsed to the floor. It's over, he thought. If they can infiltrate this far, this high, it's over. Crawling, fumbling toward his desk, he reached in the lowest drawer, withdrawing the pistol. It's over. It's over. I can't let them work through me again. He raised the pistol to his head. How many others? 
was his final thought. A pop, some spray, and Rear Admiral Littlefield slumped to the floor. And Rear Admiral Littlefield slumped to the floor.